America, land of the free. In just 200 years, she has risen from the glimmer of an idea to one of the greatest nations on earth. No other country can boast of such a brave people, such a diverse people, such a free people. But something is wrong. There is a sickness spreading, a sickness that is beginning to steal that freedom. According to the U.S. News and World Report, America, whose population makes up less than 5% of the world, is consuming 60% of all illegal drugs. Our modern-day heroes and stars are dropping dead from heart attacks and overdoses. And on this day alone, over 5,000 Americans will use cocaine for the very first time, joining the 26 million who have already tried it. During the next few minutes, we'll be taking an honest and in-depth look at the use of cocaine in our country, both the positive effects of its use and the negative. And later, we'd like to share with you what has proven to be a surprising solution to this growing problem. At the moment, it's estimated that there are over 8 million Americans using cocaine on a regular basis. But who? Who are these people? Yeah, I use c cocaine and crack. It's easy to get. Destroyed my life. It made me a slave to it. This is the pusher's dream. I was snorting from two to three hundred dollars a day. And if you take it, it's going to do you just like it do me. It's going to wreck your life. I started using cocaine when I was in high school. These people are us. You, me. People from every class, every race, every background. From yuppies to hippies. High schoolers to hard hats. Street people to movie stars. Cocaine has a devastating effect on the Hollywood community. I'm a pastor right here in the midst of it. With pastoral confidentiality, I can't divulge names, but I could tell you of homes that have been wrecked, of of wives of famous, glamorous people who are, are just utterly destroyed by cocaine. I have a, an actor friend, and not long ago, he was in my office, and he just fell on his knees and started sobbing and sobbing, and he said, I am under the control, absolute control of cocaine, and I can't get out, and it's wrecking me. It's wrecking my marriage, everything about me. Before I'd go surfing, I'd do a lot of cocaine and get all amped out, like high voltage. Okay, so you're a dealer, but you're out of it now because yes, you... Yes, because of crack. Because you got hooked put, on your own yeah, stuff. Yeah, put me on a mission. A lot of great athletes, man, they're getting involved, you know. Look at the great Lynn Bias, man. We were expecting so many great things of him. You know, at the prime of his life when he'd received everything he wanted, playing with a professional team, and on top of that, he was going to the champions of the whole world.
football is such a team sport. The element of, of counting on everybody, on every single play, is, is there. And, you know, when you're on drugs, you just can't respond to that kind of a challenge. One of the great tragedies that drugs was responsible for that was uh, the, the taking of the life of Don Rogers. Uh, here is a guy that was probably rated as one of the top four or five safety men in our game. He paid a, a very severe price for the chance of that one moment's pleasure. My first cousin who I grew up with and we started singing songs together when we were teens, you know, and we started the group in, in 1961. My cousin Brian, there is a case of a guy who is at the top of his profession, a literal musical genius, but starting in the mid-60s, when he started fooling around with pot and then acid and then later cocaine and stuff like that, he went from the height of creativity, uh, rivaling the Beatles in the mid-60s, which was a big deal. He went from that height of brilliance and creativity and productivity to as low as he could, like a vegetable, like completely withdrawn to society. And what drove him over the edge from sanity and creativity to insanity, paranoid schizophrenia, uh, was the drugs that he, that he took. Okay, Tammy, here we go. Once more. That looks good. Right when they walk in the door, you can tell a user, they're, they're loud, they're obnoxious. They, they're not coherent. They really don't know what they're doing. The, the glamorizing is gone. The, the glamour of coke, the glamour of being this high fashion glamour model. It's not that anymore. It's, it's a lot of hard work. They want you there on time. They want you, you working most of the day that you're there. They don't want you coke. They don't want you drugged out. You're, you're working hard for your money. In the age According to government surveys, the greatest number of current users is between the ages of 18 and 25. I got involved at the age of 18. I found myself just a year ago, you know, I was 18 years old, really involved with cocaine. But frequently, experimentation begins much earlier. And then at uh, 14, I started snorting cocaine. When I was about 17, I had about a $1,400 a week habit. You know, and the only way I could support that habit was to deal. I dealt a lot in the high schools, and I'd say about a th the youngest person that ever got dealt to from me was about a 13-year-old. We find that uh, it's not uncommon for children uh, between the ages of uh, 9, 10, 11, 12 to begin uh, experimenting with cocaine use or, or alcohol use. What grade are you in? Second. So you're in the second grade and you see it at your school? I've never seen anything out of control like it is now, especially with the young people. My message here on the streets, weep for your children. You look at all these kids around here in these parks, six, seven years old. By the time they're 10, 12, 13 years old, they're gonna be lost on crack. I first started using cocaine when I was 13. Although the overall use of illegal drugs is declining among young people, the use of cocaine is not as can be seen by these high schoolers casually snorting cocaine on campus as their classmates pass by. In fact, in just two years from 1983 to 1985, the rate of high school seniors who are current users has increased by over 36%. Why? If we're gonna take an honest look at cocaine, then we're gonna to have to take a look at the positive side as well. I mean, let's face it, with that many users, it must have something going for it. When you let it out, there's this incredible rush, and you can feel it from the top of your head down to the tip of your toes, all the way down your fingers. The only thing I can describe it that would be close to it is that of a sexual climax, except intensify that maybe a hundred times. The high is really quite simple to explain with the use of cocaine. Once it enters the body through the oxygen transport system, it uh, travels to the brain in approximately four to 10 seconds. There it causes the release of three neurochemicals or enzymes, uh, particularly uh, endorphins, which uh, numb the body as in the case of runners, and uh, norepinephrine, which causes a tremendous ru rush of the body and the stimulus to the blood pressure and the pulse. It makes you feel so good and so speedy that that you feel like you're going 
on a on an elevator about 100 miles an hour to the top of the Empire State Building. And your heart feels like it's going to stop. I felt like a he woman. You know, uh, I was great. I was it. Individuals who use cocaine to make it through a job, uh, as such as a stuntman, will use it to uh, uh, help him mentally get through a job, uh, a stunt that he doesn't know or that he fears he's going to be injured in. In the past, also, stuntmen would work one job all day long and take coke and then go to another job at night and take coke to stay awake. This was pretty commonplace until uh, a lot of injuries and deaths occurred due to the drug. And thirdly, and most important, is dopamine, an enzyme which uh, in itself gives a feeling of well-being. It's a natural chemical, and it provides our normal feeling that we have. But th in this case, it, it causes a tremendous high. I felt like I was on top of the world. I would feel like I could accomplish anything. I would feel up and on top of everything. OK. Those are some pretty impressive reasons for using cocaine. But what about the other side, the downside? The problem is that approximately after five to 10 minutes, this, is, this wears out. The patient goes into a tremendous uh, low. I just hit such lows that I'd cry and cry for hours because I didn't have the money to go out and get more so I could be up again and happy. The high is so great, but the come down is 10 times more intense, that is what kills you. You come down to the f floor, you, you, you are so, you can't even talk that you come down so bad, so bad. you're complete, completely out of it and you need that one more vial, you need it more than anything. So I started shooting up heroin to calm me down. You know, I got so depressed so many times that I tried to kill myself about four or five times. Uh, I was thinking suicidal thoughts. I wanted to jump in front of a subway car. I wanted to cut my wrist open, you know? I just felt terrible. I wanted to die. As one goes on and on with cocaine, you uh, starts using it more frequently, the nervous system is wired so that it, what was once a high becomes a low, and what was once elation becomes depression. And it feels like every demon in hell is on your shoulders and you want to take another hit and you start coming down and you just can't get it, and especially if you can't get it. You can't sleep, you don't want to eat. Every nerve in your body is screaming out for just one more hit, just one more hit. He was literally afraid to go in the shower and take a shower because he didn't want to enter this space. That was one of his million paranoias. He was afraid of people. He was afraid of his own shadow. You get a paranoia feeling. You get a feeling you can hear everything around you. You get a feeling that there's somebody peeking at you from somewhere, but you, you can't see them, but they can see you. You can even get so into the paranoia that you can think that you see shadows moving across windows or open cracks or light. He also has an inability to, uh, towards any type of sex drive. There's a total indifference to sex. I didn't have no sexual desires. Cocaine took away all my sexual desires. Most people think that sex is more fun with cocaine, but that's not true. It numbs you and you don't enjoy it as much. So what we basically have is a trade-off. Incredible highs for devastating lows. But if one is willing to pay the price for those highs with those lows, then what's the problem? The problem's in the fine print. There are a few hidden dangers that are seldom mentioned. My 20-year-old is um, in Los Angeles County Jail facing 21 counts of armed robbery and possibly attempted murder, uh, trying to get money for cocaine. And my 19-year-old was shot by the police about six weeks ago, uh, attempting to uh, rob a liquor store to support his habit. Cocaine ripped me off of the best years of my life from 16 to 21. Instead of enjoying myself and having friendships and meeting new people, I was in search of another high. And it just left me an empty shell, a nothing. Eventually, you know, it's worse, it's worse than using heroin. It's worse than heroin? Yeah, it's worse than heroin. My first cousin, Dennis, was a guy who 
had all the physical charm and, and good looks. He was like the drummer of the group and it was a great uh, sportsman, a surfer and a great athlete, you know, and uh, completely ruined himself. At the last part of his life, he didn't go surfing, didn't do anything physical. He was just, you know, drinking and, and doing drugs. He had a tremendously strong nervous system and he did a lot of it for a long time. Dennis actually died from basically what was a, a history of drug and alcohol abuse. I mean, he literally died. Uh, the reason of death was drowning, but in all actuality, he was drinking and doing cocaine like uh, during the day and night. I mean, he, he just completely burned himself out. It was a tragedy. I wasn't only hurting myself, but I was hurting my mother. I was hurting my whole family. You know, and, and he had so much potential. And it just seemed like his whole life was going down the drain. And I, I, I it, it, it just really, uh, it, it broke my heart. It was very heartbreaking. I was very scared. I was scared of what he would do to me. I was scared of what, he, what happened to him, you know? It's kind of like, um, thought at times that I really was living in hell. I'd cry, I'd cry because I knew the hurt and the pain that, that was going through my wife, Miriam, and, and what I was doing to her. I was, I was mentally abusing her, I was physically abusing her, I was emotionally abusing her. Sometimes I go back and I think about, you know, the things that we've done things that we've been through, the people that we've met. <laughs> I weighed about 85 pounds. I was in and out of mental institutions. My emotions were shot. My mom's nerves were shot. She was on the verge of a nervous breakdown. I felt, what kind of father have I been? How did I fail? There is absolutely no feeling that I can describe to you that can describe my pain to see someone that you brought into the world, that you held in your arms, and that you laughed with and cried with and held when they were sick, to see them killing themselves and not caring who they're hurting. It's a very, very hard thing for, I think, any human being to take. It cost me my wife's life. Uh, one night when I wasn't home, a dealer who we were heavily indebted to came by and tried to get her to pay the money and ended up killing her. So it, it really cost me everything. It steals your youth. It takes it away from you. Uh, you accelerate the aging process drastically and people who are in their late teens and early 20s look and act like uh, people who are much older. Haggard skin, bags down to here, just an overall aging. 16 year old girls that come in look like they're 25, well they're not going to last a year in this business because modeling, it stresses youth. I look like I was 85 years old, I looked ugly. My mom just, she used to tell me, go look in the mirror, she'd say, you're pathetic. She says, I never, I never thought I'd tell you that, but you're pathetic, you're a mess. Look what you're doing to yourself. Finally, there's the problem of premature death and suicide, both rising at alarming rates in connection with the use of cocaine. I had friends who were dying left and right. Three of them committed suicide. One of them jumped off the Empire State Building naked. I had my, one of my best friends, which I call my little brother, he OD'd in my hands. It's a devil, it's a demon, it's a killer. This is like the second one in one month that drugs have taken the lives of two of my, you know, close friends and relatives. 
There are two major physiological problems that occur with the use of cocaine, specifically microscopic uh, tears in the heart muscle itself. This tearing causes a depletion of four major enzymes that the heart releases. This, in turn, causes irregularity of the heart and hence leads to the increased chance of heart failure or heart attack. We have also seen a large number of permanent damage to organs as a result of cocaine use, such as permanent damage to the hearts and heart attacks that you would normally see in 40, 50, 60 year old men we are seeing now in teenagers as a result of cocaine use. And I was grabbing my chest and I thought that I was gonna pass out from a heart attack. But at the same time I said, hey, don't touch it. And I was telling my friend, don't touch it, because I still wanted to smoke it, even though it was killing me. There was a fellow who I had gotten some drugs for, cocaine. And the very same night, we all went over to, quote, party, and found him dead in his house, dirty and alone, of an overdose because of the drugs that I had given him. And another friend who, at 27 years old, his heart had just worn from the use of cocaine, and he dropped dead and lost all the years of his youth. It's gone, you can't get him back now. There's been a marked increase in the amount of cocaine-related emergencies in the last couple of years. In the older teenage group, it has at least doubled, and we're seeing increases in cocaine overdosage, not only in the teenagers, but in the pre-teenage group as well. The second major problem with the use of cocaine is stroke. The cocaine causes an increase in norepinephrine, as shown here, causing spasm in the vessels leading to the brain. These spasms will eventually lead to rupture in one of the vessels of the brain. This thereby causes strokes, and what will result is paralysis, or in many cases, death. How long do you go without sleeping? Three days. Three days. Three days. Your skin and bones now, what do you weigh? 117 pounds. What'd you used to weigh? 136. How much longer do you think you're gonna be living? Approximately eight months to a year. You think you've got eight, eight months, months to, to a year? year? Yeah. And that's it? That's it. Okay, so it can be dangerous. But that's for the constant users, the druggies. What about the weekend user? What's wrong with using cocaine for a little recreation? Doing a line or two at parties now and then, or even just trying it once to find out what all the fuss is about. You just can't do it once because it like takes control of you. It's like, it rules you around. You don't rule it no more. Once leads to another time and another to another. And then at that point, you, you swear to yourself, well, I'll never do it again, I'll never do it again. But that's just a lie, because you will do it again. You will. Now it's true, not everyone who tries cocaine for the first time is going to turn into a drug-crazed addict. But latest studies indicate that the addiction rate, especially among teenagers who begin using cocaine, can be as high as 20%. 20%? That's one out of five. And the frightening thing is that, to date, there is absolutely no way of determining who will become addicted. Cocaine is not a game. Using it is very dangerous. Oh, wait a minute, you're using it all the time. What do you mean? It's because of a reason that I'm hooked to it. There are certain people who apparently can take certain substances and be okay in life. There are other people who take the same dosages, same things, and it destroys them. I mean, to, to think that you can control the use of these things, it's like uh, putting a 45 to your head and playing Russian roulette. Russian roulette. For some, the process is immediate. The first time I started cocaine, I got hooked. For others, it will take a little longer. And I started using cocaine mostly on the weekends at parties. But before I knew it, cocaine had taken over my life. My grades started dropping. I went to practice loaded. And uh, ultimately, I was kicked off the football team. It, 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 no matter how strong you think you are, there's no way. I thought I was strong. I thought I could just do it on the weekends. It, you can't. 
You can eventually, no matter who you are, it will come, it will, it will get you. There's no such thing as a weekend user, only a beginner. Not long ago, Dr. Mark S. Gold conducted a survey of 500 users who called his national cocaine hotline. Their comments were quite revealing. Now it's a reality, I have to do it or I can't get through the day. The day revolves just around how I can get that money for that crack. According to the survey, 73% of the users had lost total control and were unable to limit their use of the drug. You steal, you sell everything you got to get cocaine. You'll sell your mother's rings, you'll sell anything that you think you can get away with. You become less than a person. To support their habit, 45% had stolen from family, friends, or employers. What happened was the business started to sour and I found myself on the verge of bankruptcy virtually for a rather extended period of time. 40% of the users had experienced job or career problems. Probably the thing that I have to live with now that hurts me the worst because of my addiction to drugs is the fact that my little girl is going to have to grow up in a broken home because it totally destroyed my marriage. And over 50% had either been threatened with a divorce or separation, or had actually been through a divorce or separation with their spouse or live-in partner. All this to say that at the moment, cocaine, in its various forms, is one of the most psychologically addicting drugs available. In fact, when given a choice between food and water, or cocaine, laboratory animals would invariably choose cocaine. For example, this rat, given unlimited access to cocaine, self-injected 32 times in two and a half hours. Given unlimited access, the rats will keep taking cocaine until they kill themselves. No other drug induced such uncontrollable cravings. When we, we could have two or three hundred dollars cash in the morning and nothing to eat and she had a six-year-old child and we'd be done shot three hundred dollars worth of cocaine and that child doesn't have nothing to eat. Sometimes I used to have to get up and fix him uh, sugar water, mayonnaise sandwiches, stuff so that he can eat, but the coke had possessed us that bad. When I was in high school, I played baseball, and I was a star pitcher. I was rising fast, and I had scouts from the major leagues come down and talk to me. And when I was out of high school, I would have been right in the major leagues. But I had to make a choice between cocaine or baseball, and I had to have cocaine more than I wanted baseball. So it really hurt me as, as a person who cared about my cousins to see this happen to them. And so I'm completely 100% against any kind of drugs because you never know what those drugs will do to you as an individual. Probably if I stop, I'll have time to live. But you're not going to stop, are you? Eventually, yes. When? Eventually, yes, soon, very soon. Two years from now, after no. you're already dead? No, eventually very soon, very soon. How many capsules did you smoke yesterday? 26. Doesn't sound like you're stopping to me. Yeah, from, from 30 to 26, there's four capsules down, you know? Mm. And uh, eventually I will stop, you know? Eventually I will stop. It's a progressive illness. It's progressive. It only gets worse, it does not get better. The obvious question now is why? Why, with all these risks and dangers, does the use of cocaine continue to rise, especially with young people? Because if we can understand the whys, then maybe, just maybe, we can begin to discover part of the solution. Studies conducted ever since the early 70s point to three major reasons. Curiosity, peer pressure, and something to fill up that boredom and emptiness. Of course, I was curious. So I tried them. When, when I was a kid in high school, I, I, I thought it was, it, the main thing was it, to be cool, you had to get into that crowd and get high like everybody else and do cocaine and, 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 and do all, all, all sorts of drugs. And, you, and then you would be accepted and you, and you were part of the cool crowd. Now, now I think back and I say, now I, wish I, I wish I could be that person that doesn't do drugs, I look at them and say, wow, they're cool. They're, they're the good people because they have the willpower not to do anything. But most of all, I really feel like people use the drugs because they're lacking something in their life. They're, they're trying to fill a void 
and, they, and the cocaine temporarily fills that void for them. Curiosity, peer pressure, and something to fill up that boredom, that void. Well, at the moment, the curiosity problem is being handled quite adequately. As we draw more attention to it, there are more people coming forward and talking about... Uh, well, Everywhere people, people are exposing the dangers of cocaine, from politicians and, uh, to the media and to educators. Many are making great contributions in this area and with friends? a sizable impact. What did I ask her to do that time? I asked her to go out and smoke some dope. Good or bad? Bad! The I same bad? can be said for dealing with peer pressure. Ooh, you want to take some marijuana? No, thanks. There are a number of organizations, campaigns, and community programs that are teaching young people how to say no. The evils that are threatening our children and our families has to be done away with. No more crack! 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 But what of the third problem? The need to fill up that emptiness. I think there are two groups of people, uh, two types of kids in schools today. There are the kids that are already using drugs, and when you give them drug information, you, uh, uh, they get turned off. Uh, they don't need that information. They already know more about it than you do. Then there's the majority of kids who are not involved in drugs and really have no intention of doing so. What they need is not drug information, but what they need is something to fill a void, something to fill a gap in their life, to give them something to live for. But when I came through these doors, you know, at Teen Challenge, I couldn't even go one hour without doing this crack. I mean, one hour, I, I, I would be like a raving maniac to, you know, just to get this crack. And, and I, I, I sat down and I, and I never even thought about it since I've been here for seven days. Several years ago, the government sponsored a study of the drug rehabilitation program, Teen Challenge. And what they found was quite remarkable. While the majority of other programs could claim only a 5 to 10% cure rate, Teen Challenge's success rate was 86%. 86%. Perhaps Dr. Catherine D. Hess, the research director, put it best. There is no question in my mind that the Teen Challenge program is the most successful one I have ever seen. When one looks at the fact that 86% of the fellows are drug-free five years after having gone through the program, and also 70% are working out in the production field, and that 57 out of the 64 have gone back for further education. This, to me, is a successful rehabilitation program. Why? What's the difference? There were other programs similar to Teen Challenge, but their success rates didn't even come close. Finally, after extensive research, the study could only find one answer one element that the other programs did not have. Its name? The Jesus Factor. When I was at rock bottom, I had nothing left. My mom and dad didn't want anything to do with me. So I figured the only way out for me was to commit suicide. So I tried to commit suicide in an alley by overdosing on cocaine, and I had successfully overdosed. And a man who lived up the street drove up, found me overdosed, and started sharing Jesus Christ with me. And just a few weeks down the road, I accepted Jesus Christ into my life. And I know to this day, I don't have a need for cocaine and never will again in my life. Jesus not only came in and filled that void, but he filled it to overflowing. And he's fulfilled a lot of empty spots in my heart that I've, that I've been looking to have fulfilled for many years. The Jesus Factor. If you're a young person already fed up and bored with life, if you feel there's got to be more but you just can't put your finger on it, don't turn to drugs or alcohol. Not only are they temporary, but they'll always, always wind up stealing more than they give. If I could take each one of you by the hand and lead you through what I've seen and what I've been through, you would never ever think of using cocaine or any other drug. Cocaine is a killer, and if it doesn't kill you physically, it'll kill you emotionally. If you're seriously trying to fill up that void and are looking for something that will last, why not take an honest and objective look into Jesus Christ? 
Don't go by what others say or think or believe. Don't go on secondhand information. Find out on your own. You know, Jesus said, I've come that you might have life and have it abundantly. <laughs> That's what God has to offer. Life. Abundant, overflowing. But don't take my word for it. Check him out for yourself. You know, I'm wet behind the ears still with the, with this uh, religion thing, you know, this, this Christ, but it's, it worked a miracle for me so far, so I'm going to stay and stick it out. That's all I can, you know, that's, that's, that's where it's at right now. I think we all want to be loved, and, and cocaine is just a temporary satisfaction to fill that void when instead the love of Jesus could fill it like that and fill it completely. My wife joined me, and together we've learned what the Bible says, that a man shall leave his mother and father, and two shall become one. We learned that with Jesus Christ as the head of our family that we can live a full, a complete, a happy life. With Jesus Christ, we can live a free life. He's more than real, more than real. He gives you a high you'll never be able to explain. He takes the place of all that. Through Christ, I can move a mountain if I wanted. This is how it makes me feel. Through Christ, all things are possible. Everything is possible. I can't even hardly talk no more because I feel so good about what Jesus has done in my life. I'm a man now, and I want to be somebody, and I'm going to be somebody one day. I love God, and He loves me. When I, everybody turned their back on me and left me for dead, Jesus Christ came in and pulled me up out that darkness. And I'm going to stick with him as long as he'll have me. And I think that's forever. And that's all I got to say. Amen. Amen, brother. That's all. I can't tell you no lies. This is the truth. He loves me. And nobody else did. He pulled me away from it. Drugs and nothing can never stop me again as long as I got Christ.